NASA looks at going to the moon one day and to Mars and to get to Mars, they're going nuclear. Space has always been fascinating to people. While gazing at the sky, scientists and philosophers alike have pondered life's deepest questions. What would it be like to go to distant galaxies and, more importantly, what kind of life might exist there? Space is just... space. The size is absurd. It would take years to go to our nearest neighboring star, even if we could travel at the speed limit of the universe. We at least have science fiction like Star Trek to test the human imagination, even though we haven't quite found the answers to these issues. But today, owing to NASA's alert system detection, the final frontier may be within reach. Have we created something that is capable of traveling at the speed of light? Is warp speed merely a ridiculous invention of science fiction, or is it actually conceivable? Let's find out. Since nothing can move faster than the speed of light, it is the fastest object that has ever existed. Light may reach the moon from the Earth in just over a second due to its speed of 300,000 kilometers per second. In less than the span of an eye, light may streak from Los Angeles to New York. Proxima Centauri is the star that is closest to Earth. 4.25 light years separate it from Earth. The Parker Solar Probe, which is currently in orbit and is the fastest spacecraft ever, will have a peak speed of 450,000 meter per hour. At that speed, Los Angeles to New York City would be reached in just 20 seconds, but the solar probe would need around 6,633 years to travel to the closest neighboring solar system to Earth. Why can't we simply use conventional rockets? Take into account the space shuttles, which entered Earth's orbit from just a few hundred kilometers above the surface of the planet. In comparison to the corresponding 10 km distance to Alpha Centauri on the same scale, this distance is roughly the breadth of a hair if Earth were the size of a sand grain. Although we have created starships, the space shuttles weren't starships. Five spacecraft from Earth are now leaving the solar system and traveling through interstellar space. The New Horizons spacecraft, the two Pioneer spacecraft, and the two Voyager spacecraft are included. Compared to the speed required to move among the stars, everyone is moving incredibly slowly. So let's think about the two 1,977 launched Voyager spacecraft, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Although neither Voyager is pointed at Alpha Centauri, if one were, it would take tens of thousands of years for it to arrive there if it kept moving at its current rate. The Voyagers will eventually pass other stars. About 40,000 years from now, the distance between Voyager 1 and AC plus 793888 a star in the constellation Camilla Pardalis will be 1.6 light years. Voyager 2 will pass 4.3 light years away from Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, in about 296,000 years. 4.3 light years. That is how far Alpha Centauri is from Earth. How about the New Horizons probe, the first probe to ever travel to Pluto and its satellites? The speed of New Horizons is 58,536 km per hour. It was launched from Earth in the middle of January 2006, and it took nine and a half years to travel to Pluto. It would take around 78,000 years for New Horizons to reach the Alpha Centauri system if it were pointed in that direction, which it is not. As a result, traditional rockets are ineffective because they are simply too sluggish. People will need to travel faster than light if humanity ever hopes to travel conveniently between stars. Faster than light travel is currently only a possibility in science fiction. Wormholes allow some characters, such as the astronauts in the films Interstellar and Thor, to instantly travel between solar systems. Another strategy is warp drive technology, which is well known to Star Trek aficionados. A few issues presented themselves to the Star Trek writers as they sat down to plot the series. In essence, they were producing a space opera, a type of science fiction that is set in space and spans a number of galaxies and millions of light years. Another illustration of the space opera subgenre is the Star Wars movies. A show like Star Trek isn't meant to be boring or conventional, as the word opera suggests. Rather, when viewers think of the series, 
they probably envision melodramatic stories involving aliens, space travel, and intense laser battles. Gene Roddenberry, the show's creator and the other writers, had to devise a timely, dramatic manner to transport the protagonists throughout the universe. At the same time, they intended to follow physics as closely as possible. The largest issue was that even if a starship could move at the speed of light, it might still take hundreds or even thousands of years to get from one galaxy to another. For instance, it would take roughly 25,000 years to travel at the speed of light from Earth to the center of our galaxy. Of course, watching something like this wouldn't be that interesting. The problem's opera component was resolved when warp speed was developed, since it permitted the Enterprise to travel much quicker than the speed of light. What was the justification, though? They needed a way to explain how something could move faster than the speed of light, which Einstein's special theory of relativity ruled out. The initial challenge the authors faced was much easier to overcome than you may expect. The oldest trick in the physics book, Newton's Third Law of Motion, is also one of the most crucial things you need to understand before comprehending warp speed. This law, which you have certainly heard of before, asserts that there is an equal and opposite reaction to every action. It simply means that there are two forces acting on each object as a result of every interaction between them. For instance, two billiard balls at rest will exert an identical amount of force on each other if you roll one into the other directly. The stationary ball will drive the moving ball away by striking it, but the stationary ball will also push the moving ball back. Every time you speed in a car or fly in an airplane, you can feel this rule at work. You sense pressure on your seat as the car accelerates and advances ahead. While the seat is pushing against you, you are also pushing back against the seat. So what does the Enterprise and Star Trek have to do with this? A person would be killed by being slammed against his seat even if it were possible to accelerate to a speed that is roughly half that of light. Even though he would be pushing back with an equal and opposite force, his mass is simply too small compared to the spacecraft. This is similar to what happens when a bug splatters on your windshield. How, then, can the Enterprise travel faster than the speed of light without the people on board perishing? We can turn to Einstein and the link between space and time to get around Newton's third law of motion and the impossibility of matter moving faster than the speed of light. Together, time and space, which have three dimensions, up-down, left-right, and forward-backward, form what is known as the space-time continuum. It's critical to comprehend Einstein's theories on the space-time continuum and how they apply to the Enterprise's interstellar journey. Einstein makes the following two postulates in his special theory of relativity. For all observers, moving or not, the speed of light is the same, about 300 million meters per second. The same physical rules should apply to everybody moving at a steady speed. By combining these two concepts, Einstein came to the conclusion that space and time are relative and that an item in motion actually perceives time more slowly than one at rest. We travel at a fraction of the speed of light, which may sound crazy to us, so we don't see the hands on our clocks ticking more slowly when we're sprinting or flying. In fact, scientists have demonstrated this behavior by launching atomic clocks in rapid-fire rocket ships. They arrived back on Earth a little bit later than the local time. What does this imply for Captain Kirk and the rest of his crew? A thing truly experiences time at a much slower rate the nearer it is to the speed of light. It would take the Enterprise 25,000 years of Earth time to reach the galactic center if it were moving safely at a speed approaching that of light. However, the journey would likely only take the team 10 years. Even if that period of time might be feasible for the people on board, we are faced with yet another issue. A Federation trying to manage an interplanetary civilization would have difficulties if it took 50,000 years for a starship to strike the core of our galaxy and return. In order to maintain the passengers' alignment with Federation time, the Enterprise must steer clear of the speed of light. At the same time, it also needs to travel faster than the speed of light to efficiently navigate the cosmos. Unfortunately, nothing is faster than the speed of light, according to Einstein's special theory of relativity. Therefore, 
If we are considering special relativity, space travel would not be possible. The general theory of relativity, a subsequent theory by Einstein that explains how gravity influences the structure of space and the passage of time, is what we need to examine in this regard. A stretched out sheet comes to mind. The sheet will distort if you put a bowling ball in the center of it because of the pressure the ball puts on it. A baseball placed on the same sheet will roll in the direction of the bowling ball. Despite the fact that space doesn't behave like a two-dimensional bed sheet in this simplistic design, it can be used to explain how our solar system's more massive planets like the Sun can bend space and change the orbits of the planets in its neighborhood. Of course, the planet's enormous speeds prevent them from colliding with the Sun. The most crucial idea in terms of warp speed is the power to control space. The crew of the Enterprise could avoid traveling at the speed of light if it could distort space-time by enlarging the region behind it and reducing the region in front of it. The spaceship might move locally at very modest speeds as long as it generates its own gravitational field, avoiding the drawbacks of Newton's third law of motion and maintaining synchronization between the clocks at its launch and destination. It's more like the ship is drawing its destination toward it while pushing its starting point back rather than actually moving at a certain speed, per se. A starship's crew is shielded by a warp bubble that surrounds it as space and time are warped. Science fiction writers have a lot of options because Einstein's general theory of relativity concepts are complex and still subject to interpretation. With our current technology, we may not be able to bend space and time, but a fictitious society situated in the future may be fully capable of creating such a device with the correct imagination. In the Star Trek world, a warp drive is used to achieve warp speed. The matter-antimatter reactions that fuel the warp drive are controlled by a chemical called dilithium. Electroplasma, a form of substance with its own magnetic field, is produced in this process and interacts with the starship's warp coils to produce highly energetic plasma. Typically, a warp nacelle, as described by the Star Trek writers, houses the warp coils. A warp field or bubble is created around the Enterprise by the entire system, keeping the ship and its crew safe as space moves around them. Mexican theoretical physicist Miguel Alcubierre demonstrated in 1994 that it was mathematically conceivable to compress space-time in front of the spacecraft while expanding it back within the confines of general relativity. What does that imply, then? Think of two spots being 33 feet apart. It would take 10 seconds to get from point A to point B if you could move one meter per second while standing still at point A. Let's assume, however, that you could somehow reduce the distance between point A and point B so that it is now only one meter. You could then travel through space-time at your top speed of one meter per second and arrive at point B in a little under a second. Since you are not moving faster than the speed of light in the space around you, this strategy theoretically does not violate the rules of relativity. The warp drive from Star Trek was theoretically feasible, as demonstrated by Alcubierre. We're about to reach Proxima Centauri, right? Alcubierre's approach to compressing space-time, however, has one drawback. It needs negative energy or negative mass. Alcubierre's warp drive would function by enclosing the spaceship in a bubble of flat space-time and bending space-time around that bubble to shorten distances. Either a ring of negative energy density or negative mass, a hypothetical sort of matter, would be necessary for the warp drive to function. The only alternative is negative energy as negative mass has never been seen by physicists. A warp drive would require a significant amount of mass to push the particle-antiparticle balance in the direction of negative energy. One of the particles would be imprisoned by the mass if, for instance, an electron and an anti-electron appeared close to the warp drive, causing an imbalance. In this imbalance, there is a decrease in energy density. This negative energy would be used by Alcubierre's warp drive to build the space-time bubble. But you would need a lot of stuff for a warp drive to produce enough negative energy. According to Alcubierre, the mass of the entire observable universe would be needed to power a warp drive with a 100-meter bubble. Chris Van Den Broek, a scientist, demonstrated in 1999 that increasing the volume inside the bubble while maintaining a constant surface area would dramatically lower the energy requirements to roughly the mass of the Sun. 
significantly better, but still far above what is practicable. A futuristic setting? Two recent publications, one by Eric Lentz and the other by Alexei Bobrik and Gianni Martyr, offer methods that seem to bring warp drives closer to reality. Yes, human ingenuity has always managed to overcome obstacles that seemed insurmountable. In his spare time, NASA engineer David Burns has been developing a solution to this issue. He claims to have created a design for an engine that, without the use of fuel, could travel up to 99% the speed of light. Burns uses a thought experiment using a box holding a weight hanging by a thread, two springs at either end of the box, and the weight shifting back and forth to demonstrate his idea. The weight would appear motionless, like a stabilized GIF, if this box were placed in a vacuum, like space, yet the entire box would tremble. The box would usually wiggle while standing still. However, if the weight's mass were to rise in one direction more than another, it would produce a stronger force and more push in that direction. According to the conservation of momentum principle, a system's momentum does not change in response to outside influences. Therefore, it might not be able to achieve full thrust in these conditions. A crack in special relativity does, however, provide a ray of hope. According to special relativity, things get heavier as they get closer to the speed of light. In theory, ions may move quicker at one end of the loop and slower at the other end by swapping the weight for ions in the box for a loop. The helical engine, as Burns' idea is known, is not one closed loop. It is instead a helical design that resembles a dilated spring. According to Burns, the engine accelerates ions that are contained in a loop to modest relativistic speeds before adjusting their velocity to slightly alter their mass. To produce thrust, the engine alternately moves ions in the direction of motion. Notably, the engine has no moving components other than the ions that move along a vacuum line while being confined by magnetic and electric fields. This idea has several major practical difficulties to solve, despite how impressive it seems in principle. It would be necessary for the helical chamber to be quite huge, specifically 656 feet long and 40 feet in diameter, producing 165 megawatts of energy or the power output of a power plant needed to accelerate a mass moving at one kilogram per second squared would be necessary to generate one newton of thrust. As a result, Despite the massive input, the output is incredibly small, making the process incredibly inefficient. However, in the void of space, it might actually work. If you had enough time and power, the engine could travel at nearly the speed of light, according to Burns. In spite of the fact that not all humans feel this way, a sizable portion of people want to go to other stars. While obtaining this goal may remain hard, ignoring all of the options ensures that it will be impossible. After all, the adage holds that you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Burns acknowledges the efficiency issue during his presentation and concedes that his calculations may not be accurate because they have not been reviewed by an expert. Sadly, we don't have the elaborate blueprints necessary for a working space travel engine. The helical engine created by David Burns is a key step in developing sophisticated propulsion systems for space exploration, despite the fact that it is largely theoretical and faces significant practical problems. The key to unlocking the mysteries of the cosmos and ushering in a new era of space exploration may lie in developing a light-speed engine. Even if the future may be unpredictable, ingenuity and tenacity will enable us to continue to push the limits of spaceflight. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.